Welcome back to the Comics Cube, everyone. Today, we are taking a break from Superman, and we're talking about the 1990s 80-issue with specials series by James Robinson, Tony Harris, and Peter Snayberg, Starman. Starman, in the mid to late 90s, there was a mainstream DC superhero comic book that had a cult following strong enough to warrant a month dedicated to it at the time of publication and six omnibuses from DC. And that was Starman. It focused on Jack Knight, the son of Ted Knight, the Golden Age Starman. Jack was a junk dealer who didn't really want to be a superhero, but he was kind of thrust into it. Uh, Ted Knight was created by Jack Burnley and a host of writers and editors uh, for Adventure Comics number 61, dated April 1941. As far as Golden Age heroes go, you could say it was pretty generic. Uh, he was a billionaire playboy who created a scientific device called a cosmic rod, which lets him harness power from the stars to project light beams and enable him to fly. And he had an arch enemy called the Mist. And then in the 70s, in 1976, there was another Starman for first issue special number 12. His name was Mikael Tomas, uh, created by Jerry Conway and Mike Vosberg. And he only showed up once before showing back up again in this 90s series. And then in the 80s, Adventure Comics number 467 uh, introduced Prince Gavin, the prince of a planet called Cranaltine, uh, which translates into English as Throne World. And he was created by Paul Levitz and Steve Ditko, which <laughs> that's Steve Ditko, yes. Um, and he showed up in Adventure Comics for a while and he had one crossover with Superman and that he died in one panel in the Crisis on Infinite Earths. In 1988, uh, DC finally published a series called Starman. This time it starred a totally new character named Will Payton. Uh, he was created by Roger Stern and Tom Lyle. He was created in the 80s and had a mullet. <laughs> and then uh, he lasted around 55 issues and then he died. And uh, finally, in the mid-90s, after a crisis in time event called Zero Hour, uh, Ted Knight retired, got old, and passed his, uh, his cosmic rod on to his son, David, David Knight. So Starman number one actually opens up with David Knight as Starman and then getting killed. And then Jack Knight has to, has to take up the, the mantle and that's the setup for the 80 issue series that is Starman. Uh, how did you guys end up reading Starman? Uh, let's start with Lamar. Um, probably like it's, it was a little different for me because where I grew up at, uh, we didn't really have like, like a LCS or anything. So for me, um, we would go and get stuff like from the corner stores or from the supermarkets and stuff. Cause you could still find like monthly titles, you know, they're pretty much, uh, you know, it was ubiquitous. Um, but also I use, I got a lot of my comics, like from like flea markets and things and, you know, um, yard sales and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so I actually had a lot of like these reprints of like these older comics and like Starman, you know, it, he stuck out to me because like his, it was something about his costume because like he had like the cosmic rod and then like, but like his costume was, it was like one piece. Right. And it just kind of stuck out. The design was different, you know, cause it, it just looked really, really different. And I just remember thinking like, you know, this guy has like a, you know, he has like a really cheesy costume, you know, but, but for me, cheesy is not a, is not a pejorative. Right. So it's just kind of like a state of something being something. So You're talking but, about Ted, right. You're talking about Ted. Yeah. Now. Ted. Yeah, yeah. This is Ted. I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The OG. But the more that I thought about it, I was like, if somebody has a device, like a cosmic rod, that's an incredibly powerful weapon, right? Just what it does. 
you know, which they expanded upon that later with uh, subsequent iterations of Starman and stuff like that. They really focused on like what you could do if you had one. Um, and then um, in the 90s, when I had moved to another place, we had an LCS. And this was when the the later uh, Starman comic came out. And, and um, I thought it was interesting, but I didn't collect it like, you know, it wasn't a book I got every month, but I would read it every now and again. And um, I went back and I read th that particular series uh, later and I really enjoyed it. You know, um, I, I can't really say that. It's a lot of like 90s comics that I can't say that about because they just didn't age well because they were like too in the moment. You know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s. I was born in the 70s, but I grew up in the 80s. So like once you get to the 90s, that's kind of like not my feel really. But, um, but and, and it, you know, Starman gets a bad rap, I think, amongst, you know, superheroes, I think. I think he kind of always has, you know, but um, I, I, you know, most of the, the Starman series, I've, I've enjoyed them, um, especially like when you get to um, the one that had the black costume with the giant star on it. That's uh, oh, that was that's Will. Will, Will. OK, yeah. yeah. I always dug that costume. I thought it was dope. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just dug the costume and the presentation, the visual presentation of it. So when you get into that era and all of that stuff, um, I dug that and I was really into that. But just those those various ages of Starman, like in some kind of way, I was there for all of them. And, and I found something in pretty much all of them that I enjoyed, even if I didn't stick with it. But the stuff that I was that I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. You know what I mean? So even if I don't stick with something, there's still value there for me. You know, Paul, how about you? Um, well, <clears throat> my first encounter with Ted was with a reprint of that Brave and the Bold story where Batman goes to Earth 2. I think it's called Interlude on Earth 2. And Batman goes there and finds that his older self from Earth 2 is dead. And he teams up with Robin and Robin's like really horrible to him <laughs> because uh, Robin's just lost his version of Batman. So he kind of resents this Batman. But Ted is in that and um, uh, and Hugo Strange is the bad guy in that story and he steals Ted's cosmic rod. And it's like, wow, he's got this really powerful thing. It's built up as quite a big deal that he's got the cosmic rod. And then at the end, um, uh, Batman had been looking for Dr. Fate to send him back to Earth One. But in the end, it's Ted who sends him back to Earth One with the cosmic rod. And he says, like, oh, I'm no Dr. Fate, but I think I can manage to send you to Earth One. So Ted and Starman was kind of built up in this story for me as a kid as like the next one down for Dr. Fate, you know? So, oh, he's he's, he's really powerful, you know? He's, he's a big deal. And then nothing I read afterwards kind of lived up to that, like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I kind of had experience of Will Payton uh, popping up in Superman in the reprints of 90s Superman comics because, uh, of course, Roger Stern was writing Superman and writing Starman. So he was plugging his character in Superman as much as he could, as, as you would like, uh, you know. Crisis of the Crimson Kryptonite. Yes, Crisis um. of the Crimson Kryptonite. That's it. Absolutely. <laughs> as it turns out, uh, Will Payton, having solar powers, could repower Superman. There we go. Yeah, and disguise himself as Superman because Will Payton could shapeshift for shape some shift. reason as well. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't really make that much of an impression on me, if I'm honest, because he was still wearing that horrible yellow and purple costume, oh, not so the black bad. one that Lamar described. Mm -hmm. It's and, so bad. Um, so bad. <laughs> yeah, and it just felt like, you know, you know, plugging another character kind of thing in a Superman book. And you kind of like, even as a kid, you're quite cynical, aren't you? And you're like, oh, yeah, don't force this character on me, you know. <laughs> so then I read Zero Hour. And um, was it Jurgens or Ordway? Dan Jurgens or Jerry Ordway who wrote Zero Hour? It's Dan Jurgens. Dan, Dan Jurgens. Wrote Andrew. Oh, there we go. So Dan Jurgens, he, um, when he had to Your introduce boy. these. Your boy. Dan yeah, Jurgens. I love Dan Jurgens. <laughs> but poor old Dan Jurgens, when he had, to, he had to introduce these new characters in Zero Hour, you obviously didn't know anything about them because they hadn't been properly created yet. So you had to write them really generic. So when he wrote Bart Allen Impulse, he was writing him as like typical kind of teenager, don't call me Kid Flash, kind of, you know, <laughs> because Impulse's personality hadn't been established yet. And when he wrote Jack and David, it was just Jack 
kind of handing the cosmic rod to David after Ted, their father Ted was handing died. it to David. Ted was handing it to David. That's yeah. right. Because Ted had been aged. And Jack was like, I wouldn't want that responsibility, bro. Which kind of set up the characters, but in a very sort of generic way. So I think this is a long-winded way of me saying I wasn't that into Star Man, you know. But then I bought um, the first trade, Sins of the Father, this one. Yeah. And uh, it was really great. I absolutely loved it. But by the time I got that, Starman was well into its run. And, I, and you know, it, it's quite difficult to get comics in, you know, kind of Caerphilly in South Wales. You have to go to Cardiff and, you know, it, it, we didn't have the internet back then. So it, it's, it wasn't as easy to pick up back issues and stuff. So I thought, oh, it's too much of an investment to get into this. So I never got it until about 10 years later when I was at a comic mart. And I saw all the trades for about 80 or 90 quid, like complete oh run. Oh, my. Or yeah. yeah, in in one go. So I thought, yeah, I'm getting them all now because obviously I already had Sins of the Father, but I got the rest. And then I was very dismayed to find that the trades didn't collect everything. <laughs> For true. some reason, it's true. DC had just left out huge chunks. So over the next ten years, I kind of gradually, bit by bit, pieced together the whole collection, and now I have every single part of Starman, including the little spin-offs and mini series and stuff. And let me just show you how much DC left out of the trades. This is every single part of Starman, yeah, including the trades. Ah, uh, DC's production department. Look at that. So that's My the whole goodness. collection with the trades. That's how much they left out of the trades. You know trades. what else? You know what else? Wow. Calls? I noticed I notice you have a trade for times past. Yeah, they have one times past trade and collecting all the times past ones they left out before. And then they gave up on it and never did it again. So <laughs> so for our, for the benefit of our viewers, um, David dies. And wait, no, that's talking with David. Sorry. For the benefit of our viewers, uh, periodically throughout the Starman series, you'd have a flashback issue. And the thing is, so they collected those in that times past, uh, in that times past trade, or some of them, but not all of them. The thing is, each times past issue will play on what is currently going on in the book, so that is pointless. Yeah, right. it's uh, yeah, it's just I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, the way they collected it, it was bizarre. But then they did those omnibuses in hardcover. Uh, but then they started doing them in paperback and then just stopped. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's actually quite hard to collect all the stuff. <laughs> Not for me, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you got it all at the time as it came out. I did not. But... Oh, what did you do then? So um, my first exposure to Ted and Prince Gavin was Who's Who? Because they were oh, in yeah. the same who's who issue as Superman. So, you know, that's the one I flipped through a lot. So he's got Superman of Earth 2, Superman, uh, you know, post-crisis, John Byrne, Superman. <clears throat> but then it would have, it also had the two Starmen, Ted Knight and Prince Gavin. Now, Ted looked kind of lame to me because he had a fin on his head. <laughs> and had a green cape but gavin looked really cool and you know big giant star almost all red was shooting stuff out of his hand uh i would find out later drawn by steve ditko and so you know i i read that thing where it said gavin you know gavin's bio and i was like oh he's really cool he's like a royalty blah 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 and it ends with prince gavin died during the crisis of infinite Earths. <laughs> like, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it for those of y'all who just as a side note for those of y'all you don't know what we're talking about when we say who's who uh who's who was basically like in the 80s dc would publish like what we would call today like their own wiki page but it was like a publication of comics who told you they told you what characters were in their first appearances and and all of that so when we say dc who's who that's what we're talking about 
you know that that's uh and the, their story up to that point yeah some mm -hmm. great art in it too yeah oh yeah um and then a few years later will payton showed up but he was in that horrible purple and yellow costume that you were talking about um for anybody who watches basketball you all know i hate purple and gold so <laughs> But then eventually he changed into that black costume that Lamar was talking about, which is awesome. It's an awesome looking costume. So I randomly picked up a Starman issue uh, from Will Payton's run. And that Starman issue, as it so happened, was the second part of a two-parter with the first appearance of David Knight. That one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> The second appearance of David Knight talking about the legacy of their dad and it, and they're fighting the Mist, who is Ted Knight's arch enemy. And that's about it, because soon after that, I started collecting the Silver Surfer. Now, <laughs> <laughs> many years later, like I would see in Wizard that there's this new acclaimed Starman series starring this guy called Jack Knight. And I'm like, where the hell is Will Payton? And I refused to buy Jack Knight series. I refused because to me, Starman was Will Payton. <laughs> I refused. I was one of those fans. Um, and then one day uh, while I was living in the States, I walked into a Barnes and Noble and I saw, I was just looking through the trade paperbacks and I picked up Starman, uh, The Star's My Destination which is about Jack's trip into space to look for Will Payton. As it turns out, in that very trade, spoilers, it's revealed that Will Payton and Prince Gavin have the same soul. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So I went back to that Barnes & Noble and read all of the Starman trades I could. I did not buy them. I was a poor college kid. <laughs> and then when i was leaving the states i thought you know what i'm just gonna make one more purchase before i go so i go on ebay and i find um somebody selling all of the issues of starman for a hundred dollars so wow. i'm like i'm getting that one then um, <laughs> it actually put me over the uh weight <laughs> limit <laughs> for baggage so while i was at the airport i had to get rid of a few things but i'm like i guess i can get rid of these <laughs> but, oh, wow. because wow. i because i kept starman my friends <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, great now i had all of those issues and then i get back to the philippines i have you know all of the starman issues and then i think a year later they announced the omnibuses which means i could have not bought those issues <laughs> that's my that's my star man story but it's anyway. a better story that you got it the way you did though yeah yeah it's a much better story but then also <laughs> too you know this is dc we're talking about so you're taking a chance waiting for waiting for the publication it's like if you got the floppies and you know i'm a single issue guy anyway i'm an advocate for that so yeah at least you got the whole story because when they put the stuff out it might not have the whole story no you know? no it's true well, imagine if you'd waited for the omnibuses to come out in paperback. You'd be buggered, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, the reason that I would have wanted the omnibuses is because those covers are beautiful, man. Yeah. Like, those are beautiful covers. Um, let's talk about the relationship between, between the knights, Jack and David and Ted. Um, I feel that there's a lot of dead parents in, su in the superhero genre. We don't really get a lot of interaction between characters and their dads. Um, mm -hmm. it, even with Superman, uh, you don't really get much of an interaction between him and Jor-El or, or Jonathan because Jonathan is usually the one who dies uh, between him and Martha. Uh, but he, in this one, uh, the whole series is about, um, is about Jack and Ted and David shows up sometimes as a ghost. Uh, how did you guys feel about this father-son dynamic going on? Well, 
I think in the nineties it really stood out because you know you had you had situations where they they were really playing up legacy in the nineties, like with characters like Wally West kind of idolizing the memory of Barry Allen and um you know lots of things like that going on and then later you know mainly in mark wade's comics you know but then like with starman you had the you know the legacy character the old character who was built up into this sort of grand legend was kind of inconveniently still or inconveniently for jack still around being cantankerous and and human and flawed, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a really interesting sort of dynamic in that, like, you know, you, you had the legend of Starman and then you had this, like, Ted Knight, who's just this old guy with glasses who would, uh, who, who Jack loved, but always fought with and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I really like that. It really made it stand out, that relationship, like. I think because he was both of those yeah. things, wasn't he, Ted? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, he was. He was both of those things. He was. He was this legend. He was genuinely a, an amazing hero, but he was also this cantankerous old git, like. You know? <laughs> and he he continually compared his two sons. Yeah. Which you know, dads do. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 can't, uh, and I think it's also. A lot of superheroes, and you mentioned dead fathers. A lot of superheroes are, are single children. That's mm-hmm. that's weird, but it's uh, I guess it's a convenient thing, and the the bond that Jack uh, grows with David, I think, uh, is very relatable. Uh, Lamar, what do you think of uh, the knights? Well, um, like to kind of cover. Uh, what Pauly said just now. It's like you have this idea of of um, the original star man just being like this larger than life figure. So it's to the point that he's like almost mythical in a way, right? It's because you have a lot of this imagery that's played upon uh, when it comes to that sort of thing. And then, but you have these really human moments with him, with him and his son. And like, like Pauly was saying, it's like, man, y'all think this guy's like this great hero and he's this paragon of morality but he just got finished cussing me out 15 minutes ago right <laughs> so it's interesting you know um and you normally don't see that kind of candid nature uh between just in general with, with legacy characters right it's just kind of like a lot of times they go in the path where it's just like somebody gets killed in a fight and then they're like oh well here you know uh this is you now Right. And it's just like, you know, and that's interesting to a degree, but it's just it. But it's just a different thing when you actually have uh, the person who brought who created the legacy and then the recipient of it. And it just so happens that their father and son, that's a different type of dynamic. And we usually don't see that. And, and I feel like also in a lot of ways that Jack was kind of like a metaphor for uh, like comic fans or just fans of any type of any type of property or or interest because you know he was a collector because you know he he was basically a junk man so he collected a lot of stuff and he had these very specific interests right you generally don't see that like with a superhero you know where um and the interest that he had wasn't necessarily of the time that he lived in so it it gave you have this idea with him that he's interested in these things that were happening and going on like years before he was born. Um, and he has all of these little things that he loves to, to collect because they're valuable to him. And so, you know, if you collect comic books or baseball cards or just anything like that, or, you know, even like, you know, war memorabilia, anything Stamps. like he's a character. You, yeah. You, you can relate to a guy like that. You know what I mean? Cause all of those things, you know, when you have something that's in the past, there's an attachment to it in some kind of way, because you've had decades of people talking about it and, you know, just extrapolating ideas. And so um, in a lot of ways, you know, his father is like the personification of his interests in a lot of ways. So it's just, it's just a really interesting dynamic. And with uh, Jack uh, himself, his motivations are really clear in what he's about. You know, it's really, really clear. So when he has these 
these uh, interactions with his father or like with his brother or whatever. And like you said, how, you know, his father's comparing the two sons and stuff like that. It, it like you can pull things from it. It's not just like, wow, you know, his father's a, you know, he's a butthole or whatever, but it's like, you can, you can pull things from it, you know, cause you see that kind of stuff. We, you know, we see that kind of stuff in our lives. Like we know people who go through that, their parents, it might be us to go through it with their parents or whatever, you know what I mean? But because, um, it works well when you have characters that are well-defined. And so in a lot of ways, um, Ted was more defined in this series than he was in his original publication. Ever. You know, in a lot of ways, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's interesting, you know, which, and we saw a lot of that in the 90s too, because um, like um, there was, you know, they, like Wesley Dodds got kind of the same treatment. That's true. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, is, you know, so that was that was one part of the nine. Talk about really, talk about really another really series that's not collected properly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Way to go, DC. <laughs> but I think so. I wanted to talk about that because you talked about Jack having like these really specific motivations and desires. And I feel that, you know, with Wally West, for example, I love Wally mm. West, um, Mark Wade's Wally West and everything. Uh, we see Wally West having a clear motivation, which is to try to get, live up and or get out of Barry Allen's shadow. But with Jack, you get a lot of these are my hobbies. These are the details about my hobbies. This is what it's like to trade antique chairs. These are the problems that I have to deal with when I have to deal with people trading antique chairs. You know, it's it gets really specific. And I feel like I don't see a lot of that in mm. in comics, yeah. in superhero comics yeah. at all. Like, why do you think that is and why do you think it's so effective? I I wished we had more stuff like that. Like um I'm rereading Ian Fleming's James Bond books at the moment. Mm -hmm. And of course, like um Ian Fleming's really famous for like putting loads of these extra little details about Bond's lifestyle into the book. Like he'll, you know, famously he'll go on for pages about Bond's breakfasts, you know, <laughs> and uh, what kind of breakfast Bond likes. And I, I think in Thunderball, where there's uh, there's about at least two pages where Bond's just banging onto some girl about his cigarettes for ages, <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> like, and um. But it, it's brilliant because uh, it, it sucks you in more, you know, and it makes it all seem a bit more real. And, you know, in the Bond books, the stuff gets really silly quite fast. So if you, you've embedded it on this sort of foundation of like little details about scrambled eggs and cigarettes, you know, then it, you've got this foundation to hold up the silliness, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think the same applies to Starman as well. You've got this uh, foundation of the mundane to hold up the fantastic stuff, like, um, which makes Starman stand out. That's what I feel like, too, because, uh, you know, after the 60s, I feel most superhero comics modeled themselves after Kirby, obviously. And, you know, the most bombastic thing. But with Starman, you get things like, here's Ted adjusting his glasses while he's talking, you know, or mm -hmm. somebody's like stretching their back because like they've been sitting all day and just those small tiny details like that that wasn't really it was really it made them really come alive for me and I, I keep wondering why we we didn't see that a lot I feel like we're seeing a lot of it now kind of um with some superhero books but still not a lot you know like a lot of the acting what do you what do you think Lamar mm. And, you know, with, with a character like him, um, obviously, when you think about like the, you know, Ted Knight's publication history, like his publication history goes back, like even like for us then in the 90s, it was a long time ago. So you have this guy who's, you know, obviously he's his son, so he's young. He kind of kind of has his own life already with things that he's interested in and, you know, him being a hero, he's not really interested in that. So one of the best ways to play up the concept of him, how much he just doesn't want to be a hero is to take the stories and, and put out there the other things that he has going on, right? So it's like, he's not just sitting around waiting 
for a signal to shine through the window so he could go do something, right? So, you know, because he has a very active life and he runs into all of these interesting people and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, and, and those of us who, who collect certain things, we can understand that. You know, you run into a lot of eccentric people. And so, uh, like, you know, like I collect like first editions of old books, for example, and um, sometimes dealing with those people, it's, you know, it's some of these people, they just, you know, I just would rather not deal with them, to be honest, right? <laughs> but if you, but one of the things you learn is that you learn, like, if you're patient, you can come up on something really, really good. Like, I, I have first edition books that, you know, I've seen them go for seven, eight hundred dollars, and I go to an estate sale, and I'll catch it for like 30 bucks because the person just wants to get rid of it, right? Yeah. I'd much rather do that then go and try to talk to this guy who that's what he does for a living. And he wants to tell me about all of these things about his collection that I really have no interest in. It's like, man, look, I'm trying to do a business deal here. Like, I don't, you know, I really don't care. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, so you get a little of that in this book, like what you were talking about, about the chairs, for example. Um, so I think engrossing the narrative in that, it, it goes a really long way to kind of show you how this guy really doesn't have an interest in being a superhero at all. It's just kind of something that he just kind of picked up. And in a lot of ways, he picked it up just like he picks up the rest of the things that, that you know, he accumulates as a, as a junk dealer, you know. But even just the idea of a superhero having a day job as, as a junk dealer, like... <laughs> There's nothing flashy about that, right? So if, if you want to get mundane, it's mundane. Very much so. And but he has this whole wealth of knowledge about it, right? You know, and that resonated with me because you know, I grew up, I was a big fan of Sanford and Son. So, you know, it's like, yo, here it is. You know what I mean? It's just it's no, it's not the comedy, it's the other stuff. But um, you know, yeah, it's it's just an interesting dynamic to see a superhero that doesn't want to be a superhero and he's knowledgeable in all these other things that could actually help him in his superhero work if he wanted to be a superhero. Cause like, you know, I'd imagine he could have a, uh, he could have a good conversation with Batman about, um, about antique furniture or something. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> or I, you know, which is something, you know, or like, you know, you could have somebody come to him and be like, Hey man, listen, I need some, um, I need some information on these uh, antique masks from the Congo or something like that. What do you know? And then, you know, it's be like, oh, okay, well, look here, you know, you need anything else? Let me know. You know, that kind of stuff is interesting, you know, just to see in a comic when you're talking about somebody who's supposed to be out here beating people up, but then we have all this, this intellectual extrapolation on things that you just never would even think about. You know, it's just, it just, it just makes you want to keep reading. You know, it's true. I think, um, you know, we talk about how mundane it is and how there's a lot of there's a lot of charm in the book and a lot of charm in the day to day aspect of, of his life. But mm -hmm. also um, there are seven star men. And it's made mm -hmm. pretty clear, I think at some it's made pretty clear, even by the star man of the future, star boy, Thom Kalor. Uh, Danny Blaine slash Thom Kalor basically mm. tells him, you will not be remembered as one of the greatest starmen ever. <laughs> right? He's like, yeah, you so you you were starman for this particular period of time. Your dad is the greatest starman <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, and I, it's weird, huh? Because I feel like if we see a bunch of these legacy things, there's always that kind of push to be like, yeah, or, you know, Wally West is the first person to ever go into the speed force and come right back out um mm -hmm. yeah uh, luke skywalker and everything about him but but jack knight is just he he had a time as starman <laughs> and, and there's a charm to that right there's a charm to that yeah. counterintuitiveness and uh w which like i'm i can't really articulate why that works like do you, do you guys have a favorite starman in this particular lineup or because mine is mine is actually Jack, and it's, yeah, same. It's so mundane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, well, you know, if you or me or you know the average person on the street became a superhero, 
you know, odds are, and superheroes were a real thing, odds are we wouldn't be the greatest superhero known to man. Like, you know, because mm -hmm. people, you know, you, not everyone could be the greatest kind of thing. You yeah. know? I, sorry, that sounds a bit like Ayn Rand. Sorry. But... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean it in that way. But do you know what I mean? It's like, you, you not everyone could be exceptional. That's why these people are exceptional kind of thing, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. If everyone's, if every flash is exceptional, then Wally West becomes less exceptional then, like, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is sounding very Ayn Rand, so... <laughs> <laughs> we know what but, you're getting um, at. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So, like, yeah. it, it just, it's great that Jack, even though he's like this sort of placeholder star man, that doesn't make him worthless or pointless, and it doesn't make his story not worth hearing about, like, you know? And that, that's a very beautiful thing, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah I, you, you know i don't i don't know if i think probably and i never actually thought about this until you guys brought this up just now right but um so i was kind of running it through my head but i think my favorite is ted but with the caveat that it's basically because of this book because it made me go back and read like a lot of the old comics that i would the Starman comics especially like because there was a period in time where he was teamed up with um it was Black Canary, right? Yeah. They had like a team of book, right, right. So I, I just went back and read all of that stuff through the lens that they put forth in this book. And so when you look at, like you said, you look Damn, at the guy's costume. that's different. That's completely different through the yeah, you, lens. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? So I went back and I was like, wow, man, this dude is kind of getting his, getting his rocks off here. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> you know, so I was like, yeah, okay, okay. You know, and, you know, just like, like I said, the, you know, the cosmic rod, historically has been um underused you know in regards to like the power level somebody would have with a weapon like that and so it's insanely um, powerful it yeah, is like yeah. potentially mm -hmm. green lantern ring powerful yes yeah definitely yeah definitely yeah yeah it's no question about it um because being able to control um you know like um because you're talking about stuff from stars you're essentially talking about light so being able to control photons and stuff on that level is just on the molecular level like that you can pretty much do anything you want so um you know but yeah i just went back and was reading some of that stuff and i was just like geez you know um i wish this guy would have had a series with a competent writer you know what i mean like because it, it made you it made me feel like i didn't have enough of ted knight's uh work on display because he never really had that that extended series like a lot of his contemporaries had. And so like, shoot, I want one now. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so you know, it's just like, yeah. So, and, and I think that that's probably why he's probably my favorite because uh, this book made me actually go and reassess a lot of his, his other stories and stuff. Um, and it really portrayed him in a way that he should have probably been portrayed all along because now yeah. he's kind of looked at as a joke. You know what I mean? But, you know, yeah. This book is as much about Ted as it is about Jack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really surprised me after read, because I only read the golden, some of the Golden Age Starman stuff after reading this series. Mm -hmm. And Ted Knight's wandering around in a top hat, you know? <laughs> like, and he's like, he's not depicted as this conflicted scientist. Because, of course, <laughs> nobody was uh, portrayed like that in the Golden mm -hmm. Age of comics. In the Golden so, Age comics, scientists are evil, my friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, almost yeah. always. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> mad, mad scientists. So yeah, he's just this fop in, in like a, a top hat, literally in a top hat, like you know, <laughs> with somehow has the most powerful weapon ever. Like you know. <laughs> second, second most powerful weapon. Ever. Second most powerful. Weapon ever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we were talking about like Jack being sort of uh, enamored with old things. And there's one thing I want to bring up because it's not really touched on much in the book, but I think it's quite interesting. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm sure there's at least one panel where Jack says that him and David are older than they look. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the whole idea is like Ted uh, was around in the 40s and he was active all the way up until the present day kind of thing when suddenly he, he was more uh, he was transformed to his true age so his aging was sort of held back by magical means and the implication is in starman that jack and david their aging was held back too 
So there's this sort of like unspoken thing, most of the time unspoken thing, that Jack and David are actually like potentially in their 50s, maybe. Uh, but they look like they're in their 30s. And um, oh. that's, they, they don't they don't give a figure. But yeah. like, that's how I read it, you know, when I, I saw that bit. And, um, and that gives a whole new dimension to Jack, the idea that he's enamored with the past and with these old things. And it also gives David a new dimension, because if you think about it, David has been waiting a very long time to be Starman, if indeed he is a man in his 50s who looks younger. Even he's if he's in waiting. his 30s, he's been waiting a long time. Yeah, well, exactly. And it's a bit like Prince Charles waiting to be the king, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> and the queen's just hanging in there. like you know. <laughs> so it's the same with David. So he's been waiting all these decades to be Starman, and then on his first night out, he gets shot. <laughs> so it adds <laughs> another dimension to David, too, the idea that yeah. they're older than they look. Mm -hmm. I think I read that line as they're in their 30s because okay. the other legacy heroes you know nightwing flash they're in their early 20s right yeah so i read it as we're older than we're older than those guys i'm not as young as wally west or or dick grayson yeah yeah okay but i don't know <laughs> yeah, i mean it's vague isn't it like, it's vague you know, so, yeah which I think was the right move, right? Because if you explicitly state, oh, well, we're this age and we're supposed to look this age, it goes a bit too into, like, continuity dates. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, nerdy stuff. <laughs> and that's, what, that's another thing I wanted to talk about because one of the things that this book was praised for, so this was a very critically acclaimed cult book when it was coming out. And one of the things it was praised for was that it utilized continuity. But one of the things that I've always said was I don't really think it utilized continuity so much because it just made some stuff up. Like um, that whole thing that uh, that Lamar mentioned with Starman and Black Canary. That's not in con that, that wasn't in continuity. He made that up. Like right. it, there were there were a couple of Starman and Black Canary team ups in the 60s and that was it. And then he just completely ran with that and he made that up. But the main, the main thing, the main example for me about him not really using continuity was this character called Bobo Benetti, who Starman fought, Ted Knight fought in the 40s and then, you know, imprisoned. And in this, in this uh, series, Bobo Benetti is finally released and he becomes an ally of Jack Knight. He talks about his encounters with Ted and what Ted uh, means to him and everything. Bobo Benetti is not a pre-existing character. Mm -hmm. Bobo Benetti was created for this book. So for me, it's more, it's more like a novel. You know, you read a novel that starts in the middle of the action and then mm -hmm. it kind of fills in the history as it goes along. That's what it felt like to me. To me, it wasn't about like long running DC continuity. I think it was more like, because I think in your the blog you wrote about this, you say it's more history than continuity. But I wonder if it's more like it's more mythology than than history or continuity, isn't it? Like you know, it's mm -hmm. he's using the broad strokes of the characters and the history rather than the details, which I think is mm -hmm. probably the right way to handle continuity, like you know. mm -hmm. especially DC continuity. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, the, it's frankly for DC. It's the only sane way of dealing with continuity. <laughs> it's like vaguely around this time, Batman did this. Let's not get into mm. the details, you know. And and that works, you know. Are you saying that DC continuity is not worth trying to put together in one cohesive timeline? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. I was just I was just making sure we were on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> but also the thing that you say about mythology, I mean, if we want to get back to want want to get back to talking about Ted. That's the difference is that, you know, Wally West as Wally West um, 
is the whole point is to try to get out of Barry Allen's shadow. So he's always talking about how great Barry Allen was and how he can never be like him, blah, 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 blah. But Ted Knight in this series is all about showing how great he is while at the same time showing how human he was, which you mentioned earlier. And that was very different. Um, it was both about building up a backstory that never really existed while at the same time showing him as a completely human character, which even Barry Allen didn't get. Uh, even, no matter what happened, like uh, they always kind of saw Barry as a saint. Even Jay Garrick, who was in the Flash book at the same time, and is a contemporary of Ted Knight's does not get that kind of treatment. You never see Jay Garrick as anything other than, you know, this adorable grandpa figure. I know you love Jay uh, Lamar. So yeah, no question. No question. Yeah. And, and also I'm just going to see wait for a moment. Uh, the flash of two worlds is one of the greatest stories ever written in the English language. We can keep going though. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> you know who's in the Flash of Two Worlds? The Shade. The Shade is in the Flash of Two Worlds. <laughs> so, since the Shade was in the Flash of Two Worlds, let's talk about the Shade. The Shade, to me, is like <clears throat> he's. I don't know if you guys know this, but there was talk about uh, doing a Starman TV show sometime in the late two thousands. And mm -hmm. while they were talking about it, one of the conditions was that the shade would not be in the series, presumably because he's he belongs to the Flash officer or whatever it was. I don't mm -hmm. know. The shade, without the shade, this book is not what it is. <laughs> Absolutely, it's almost like the shade gives it its voice, doesn't it? Like you know, and mm -hmm. not just because he's narrating it a lot, but. Because of just who he is and how connected he is to Opal and yeah. He is, yeah. He's he is so Starman is set in the city called Opal City, which I see that's another thing. It's really hard to articulate because there is something that sets Opal City apart from Gotham City or Metropolis or Star City or Coast City. Gotham City is a mood, you know what I mean? Like there, but you don't really know where anything is. <laughs> it's not really a, it's not really set in stone uh, Metropolis is also a mood you know it's kind of this futuristic New York type place and even Marvel's New York is just like a version of New York but you don't really have that <clears throat> kind of sense of place with Opal City I mean I'm kind of glad that my first Starman arc was Stars My Destiny the stars my destination which didn't take place in opal city because the stars my destination is the worst arc of the entire series because it doesn't take place in opal city so i'm kind of glad that mm. the bar was there for me that the rest of the series was just so much better than what i started out with so it was still good but because it didn't take place in opal it wasn't as good as the rest of it and i i don't know what it is that sets opal city apart from everything else what, what do you guys think I think, uh, it, it, well, definitely it's Tony Harris's design of it. Like, you know, it's just so evocative. Like, and again, it's this sort of one foot in the past kind of place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you could imagine like sort of, um, like it's a, I guess it's a bit, a bit of a mood itself, like, you know, but a more specific mood than Gotham, mm -hmm. you know, it, <laughs> it's this kind of like, golden age place where like you know a ghost pirate could come around the corner at any moment and, <laughs> and they've got these sort of like badlands on the outskirts where like a, you know a prairie witch flies around <laughs> and you know it's uh it, you could set a whole series in the city without starman or the shade because it's such a unique place like and you know, a family of cops have protected it. A, a family of ginger cops, yeah. <laughs> the old... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, protected it for generations, and uh, yeah, it's um, and of course, you know, this old cowboy characters used to hang around there back in the days. It's it, it's it's got as rich a history as Starman itself. It's it's almost like the sort of it's if the DC universe was 
squished down into a city, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's All DC the quirky characters setting. from the DC universe. Yeah. And, and it, it's a place for stories, isn't it? You know, you can have detective stories there. You can have pirate stories there. You can have gangster stories there. You can have ghost stories there. It's just all kinds of of things can happen and you can believe it can happen in this city. And it has a whole history too that mm. the, the book never fails to, to say what the history is, how it was founded, uh, the money mm. it was founded with, who who was killed in order to found it. And that's because the shade is in it. Uh, it's completely yeah. inextricably tied to Opal City. Uh, mm. As you say, giving it its voice. Yeah, this shade, man. This is a cool character. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and the way they flipped him and they made him, they made like his powers and stuff, which always probably you know they're better suited with like more of like a, a mystical type nature than they would be like for somebody to like you know your you know because you know we talking about he was created during the time in the age of the mad scientist right so you know everything happened as a as a lab accident or people were always making stuff in labs but his stuff is more suited i think for something a little more uh supernatural if you want to use that term but um just even doing something like that that was big you know because uh and then they just kind of took it and and ran with it from there and and they gave him all of this backstory that kind of ties into the stuff like what we were talking about about the about opal city like they could put it put out an opal city like anthology book and just tell like a story about something that happens in one part of the city and tell a different story that don't have nothing to do with it but it's all taking place in this one place. And then people are like, man, who knew all this stuff was happening here? It's, it's <laughs> like, you, you know what I mean? Like, with, you know, it's just, there's a lot that they could really do um, with that. Like if they wanted to, you know what I mean? And that would be a book that anybody could read. You know what I mean? Like you could have, you know, like, cause you know, you throw a pirate ship um, into a story or a, a giant gorilla or, you know, uh, a, a, a robot, you know, kids love that kind of stuff, man. I mean, I do, you know what I mean? So, you know, but yeah, th- there's so much potential for storytelling there. And, but that's something that we keep seeing with this series, you know, the Starman series is that all of these characters that were kind of like blank slates for decades, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're getting this, this life injected into them. And so, and so they're, it's, it's in a way they're treating these old characters like they're new characters, you know? And it's interesting because sometimes that doesn't work out when you try to do that um, because they try to recreate everything instead of just looking at the character and what you have and then just growing something out of it, you know? And they did that with the characters and they did it with the locale too. You know what I mean? Because all of these different DC comic cities, they all have their different feel mm-hmm. because a lot of them are based on real cities. But, um, and then they end up becoming characters in and of their own selves. So uh, Opal City is one of those places that ultimately is a character too, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and The Shade was able to get not one, but two spinoff series from this book. Mm-hmm. What a showcase of artists uh, that those two series had. The first issue of the first four issue series was drawn by Gene Ha. And the last issue of the second one of the 12 issue series was drawn by Gene Ha. Uh, the second issue was drawn by J.H. Williams III, a young J.H. Williams III, a pre Promethea J.H. Williams III. A, the, it was drawn, the third one was drawn by Brett Blevins. It kind of shows the dynamic between the shade and Jay Garrick and just how he, this is all a game to him. He plays mm-hmm. the super villain outside of Opal, but he will do anything to protect Opal, which I thought was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just he, this is an immortal, and he's he's just dicking around, <laughs> <laughs> and he likes playing with the Flash because the Flash entertains him. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the fourth one was drawn by Michael Zuli, who. Uh, you might remember him from from uh, Sandman. He drew the Hob Gatling issues and the the book most of book ten, um, the Wake, um, mm-hmm. and, and then the 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 Maxi series involved people like Cully Hamner, 
uh, Darwin Cook. It's just what a what a showcase of artists, man. Jill Thompson, Fraser Irving, Javier Polito. There's just something about this character that l lends himself to all sorts of different styles because he's immortal. He's been around forever, and people just want to people just want to work on him. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's one thing I want to throw in about a potential inspiration for the shade, and I want to mention it because I don't think anyone's ever mentioned this on the internet that I can see, and it might be quite tenuous here, but I want to mention it just to get it on record somewhere is um you know when the shades narrating with this uh, uh, and it's the shades journal and he'll always recap at the beginning of a comic of the of the story by saying jack knight is caught in space and bobo bonetti is doing this and blah 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 now read on and then it'll be dot, 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 dot. Dot. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's a style of recap there's a um there's an english uh singer well, it was he's dead now called uh, Vivian Stanshall and he was in the Bonzo Dog Band in the 60s and 70s and um, he's uh, he's very much a sort of English eccentric you know authentically an English eccentric you know and uh, and he, he, he the way he spoke was in this sort of very sort of uh, flowery over the top way quite similar to how the shade speaks you know mm -hmm. and uh, he had this sort of running Thing, I don't know how to describe it, called Rawlinson's End. And he'd come on the radio, uh, like do guest spots on these radio shows. And he'd just do this story about these, um, these sort of degenerate aristocrats who lived in this place called Rawlinson's End and like did like weird, silly, horrible things. And, um, uh, and, he, uh, and he always used to start it by saying such and such has happened, such and such has happened. Now read on dot, dot, dot. And he used to say the dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and the inspiration for Rawlinson's end, he said, came from when he'd be in doctor's surgeries and he'd pick up these women's magazines with like these sort of like fiction, st these stories in them. And they'd always start with a recap like that. And he'd say he was never interested in the story. He was always fascinated by the recaps, you know, because they always sounded so bizarre. Like, you know? <laughs> so um, Rawlinson's end, he would just start every single one with these sort of bizarre recaps relating to nothing that happened before, you know. And it just made me wonder, like, how much of the shade uh, is, uh, you know, was, uh, how much of Vivian Stanshaw is in the shade? And it seems like, the kind of obscure reference that James Robinson would make. But uh, I may be being very tenuous here. Uh, this may be a very, this may be a stretch, but I wanted to get it on record. And so if you see James Robinson talking about it in an interview, you can say, ah, Paul noticed that ages ago. Yeah. Let me tell you something, <laughs> Let me tell you something yeah. Paul. James Robinson, if you're watching this, you can confirm or deny it. And also please come on my show and give me an interview okay <laughs> so uh the shade uh what an amazing character what an amazing change he did to his character because he was just he was just what a stereotypical evil villain in mm -hmm. prior to this like kind of harassing yeah. the golden age flash mm -hmm. uh and here he's he's an anti-hero uh as i mentioned he'll just dicks around with a flash they they have this beautiful explanation well i don't know if it's beautiful but it's this beautifully comic booky explanation as to why sometimes he's just playing a game and why sometimes he's out for death uh, that's a that's a spoiler that i'm not going to spoil on the show because uh, mm -hmm. it gets it gets pretty deep but there's a part for example very early on in the series where he mistakenly calls the oscar wilde book the portrait of dorian gray and that pays off like in issue number 70 something which kind of blew my mind because I also, because I'm familiar with the book, uh, the, the picture of Dorian Gray uh, mm. as, uh, and I also thought it was weird that the shade got it wrong because he called it the portrait of Dorian Gray. Um, and the fact that it pays off like so many, and, and that's a common mistake people make. The fact that it pays off the, so many issues later, so many years later is just, wow you know just he he really 
planned this out like way in advance. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you you can't wouldn't get that now, would you? I think if Starman started now, it would be cancelled. No, yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you couldn't do that now. No way. It wouldn't have lasted this long. Yeah. Just the I think also the fact that you know talking about history and uh, continuity, the fact that there are multiple accounts of the same event. Like for example, there's a there's a golden age story where uh, the girlfriends of the heroes uh, take their spot for for an adventure, mm-hmm. um, and then they're like, so there are these other accounts that have that have uh, the girlfriends of Doctor Midnight and the Atom in them. That's just that's not true, and just that little fact. I I feel that one of the reasons it would get canceled so early is because continuity wise a lot of fans would be annoyed at it yeah but in the 90s and the early 2000s we embraced it you know i i don't know Mm -hmm. what changed here Mm. like why because to me that was a strength and now I feel like it would just be picked apart to death. Yeah. I think like um, there's a lot of sort of James Robinson style of writing that worked so well with Starman and Opal. And we were talking a little bit about this before we were recording. And, and then you, you put that style of talking uh, or, or like, you know, the flawed characters into other superhero contexts and it doesn't work so well and that it would be ripped apart and you know cancelled for a better word for want of a better word <laughs> whereas um you know it kind of works in opal and i wonder you know, would it still work because it's such a unique place it's such a unique uh it's such a unique voice i feel like james robinson is really suited for for like an obscure character mm-hmm. like when he was writing action comics and when he was writing mon that was fine i thought that he was, was fine writing mon but that when was he was great. writing superman not so much you know <laughs> and i don't know what it is i don't it doesn't work a lot of his stuff does mm-hmm. not work when he wrote for example he wrote i think this is an amazing miniseries the golden age it's a precursor. Yeah, to yeah. An amazing yeah. series. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad that Darwin Cook did the New Frontier, which is pretty much the, the you know, the Silver Age version of that. Mm. Because for whatever reason, I don't really get, I don't think James Robinson's voice fits in well with that kind of sensibility. I feel like it's got to be more quaint and charming and capital R romantic. Mm. and that fits and also, in better with the golden age yeah he writes really flawed characters as well you know, he's so good at doing that and um you know if, if you see jack knight talking about women in a sort of dodgy way you think this character you know is, is essentially a good man but has some stupid ideas and he's flawed in it you know mm-hmm. in the way that people are flawed um, but when you see Hal Jordan and Oliver Queen talking about women in a dodgy way, especially when it's another character like Huntress, who maybe doesn't get as much attention as Hal Jordan and Oliver Queen, it's a different dynamic and it doesn't work as well. And and, and it's a shame. Jerks. <laughs> yeah, they're just being jerks. But that's okay because I think they are jerks. You know, those characters are jerks. They're they're, they're good men, but they're jerks as well. You know. And so I get what James Robinson was doing there, and I admire it, but it didn't quite work. And yeah, which is a shame. Yeah, let's talk about um, where his voice was good in the context of Starman, because when Batman shows up for an issue, I feel like he just gets Batman wrong. He just goes way too deep into, into Batman being that dark, and grim and gritty monosyllabic person who doesn't want to be around anyone else 
which I guess maybe he does it on purpose so Jack can tell him off and say something like, you don't get to talk to Alan Scott that way. You don't get to talk to my dad that mm. way. Um, but then all of these other superheroes that he brings in, the Phantom Lady, uh, Black Condor, but especially the Elongated Man, <laughs> all of these obscure, more obscure third tier superheroes. I wanted to read more of it. Um, with Batman, though, I, I guess it's kind of like the character kind of has to serve the story, doesn't he? You know, and like if this was a Batman comic, Batman would be written a little bit differently because it was a Starman comic and Batman had to fill that role of the established famous superhero who was a young superhero who was a, being a jerk to the old superhero. And mm. um, so I don't so much have a problem with Batman being written like that for this story because it was serving the story and, and it worked in the context of the story and also i found out i've got the same favorite woody allen film as batman crimes and misdemeanors which is uh, which is quite interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah batman tries to deflect that question uh from from jack like jack <laughs> tries to do that whole thing where he talks about the minutia and the details of his hobbies to batman and batman during the mission is just like I'm not doing this, which kind of highlights how comics are, were like superhero comics did not do that. Except yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, did you Lamar, did you have a favorite uh supporting character throughout? Um did I have a favorite supporting character? You know, I I think this is one of those books for me that everybody feels their spot so well. Yeah. And they did such a good job of creating this universe with these characters that nobody would have ever thought to use in the way that they use them. It's hard for me to single out anybody because if I were to try to do that, if I were to try to single out somebody, like, for example, and the dynamics are different. Like, for example, we, we know that it's, um, we know that it's Ted's book. I mean, it's, um, it's, um, it's Jack's book, but the main hero in the book is Ted. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that alone shifts the dynamic of the book, right? Because when you're reading a superhero book, you know, you would expect, you know, the person whose name's on the cover to be the hero. And honestly, it is, right? Because Starman's the hero. That didn't yeah. change. But the dynamics are different um, because they're they're telling a different type of story. So what ends up happening. Is you Jack have, kind of falls ass backwards into success. <laughs> yes. Like he is he's the guy, he's the classic guy that got it right by accident, right? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it and and that's the thing. You know, like you have characters like like his girlfriend, um Sadie. Sadie. Yeah, yeah. Um their interactions are great because you actually see. And this is something else you don't normally see. Like you have like the love interest in the story that's that's realized as a character to the point that, you know, they have interest like apart and then they have interest together that they're passionate about. You know, you normally don't see that. You know, it's kind of like, oh, this person serves this purpose and this person is, this, you know, like that. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, we could probably do a show just about that, right? So um it's really hard for me to even say you know to be honest with you because um when you look at it from that perspective it's like i could say sadie i mean i could you know at some points in time i could say jack himself mm -hmm. um there's times where i could say the shade i mean it just it would just honestly for me it probably depends on what story i'm reading it what 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 issue i'm reading at any given moment is probably it, my answer would probably switch you know Paul, did you have anyone that you particularly got attached to? Uh, I love the shade. He, he was brilliant. Fantastic. Um, I loved, um, oh, what's his name? The O'Dear brother, who's the reincarnation. Matt. Of, Matt. Yeah, Matt. He, he was fantastic. You know, the way he was, a, a, you know, basically a bad guy at the start. And then that sort of like journey he took of redemption, that was really amazing. Um, 
I like uh, I like the the other the um the the actual evil Odea brother as well Barry. Yeah. Um, because I, I like the idea that there was one of them who wasn't a good cop and was genuinely a bad cop as well. Um, there's no redeeming quality to him whatsoever, too. He's just no, like, no. I am a bad cop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and you know, in, in a family of good cops, or at least a family of good cops, and then one bad cop who redeems himself, there is this one purely bad person, like you know, um, yeah, and and the elongated man, I, I just it's the best I've ever seen Ralph written in any this comic. Is my favorite ever. version, yeah. of Ralph Dibney, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, His absolute. And just Sue as Ralph well, Dibney. just. That um that panel and I think you have it on your blog where um Ralph goes into action and beats up a load of criminals. Yeah. And sees like, God, I love that man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is my absolute favorite uh incarnation of Ralph Dibney. And <clears throat> if they had decided to spin off Ralph after this into his own series, using this tone, because he's usually been portrayed as a as a comedic character. Um, mm-hmm. I would have absolutely picked it up. Unfortunately, that brings me to my next bit, which is, so you've got a bunch of characters here that, uh, you know, the Black Condor, Phantom Lady, Ralph Dibney. Um, you guys know what happens to them the next time you see, the, you see them? <laughs> they all get killed. Yep. <laughs> they all get killed, except for Ralph Dibney. But Sue gets killed. Oh, uh, Ralph and eventually dies, doesn't he? Ralph eventually dies, except that that that's an awesome death. Um, yeah. <laughs> the others just kind of get killed uh, uh, in Infinite Crisis number one. Uh, I feel like this book, one of the reasons that this book doesn't get talked about as much anymore is because I feel internally, and I'm not going to name any names, but his initials may start with Ds. Um <laughs> I feel like they didn't really respect this book or like it mm-hmm. in in the yeah. within the offices of DC Comics. Do you guys yeah. get that feeling? I do. I do, yeah. But sorry, Lamar, you, you can't go on. Oh no, I was just saying. I was just saying. I agree. You got it, Paula. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, Matt. Mm-hmm. Um, I I agree with you, but at the same time, I feel like you can't really complain about it because James Robinson does the same thing with other characters. Like there's That's... there's a shades uh, there's a mist spinoff where um James Robinson slaughters a bunch of minor Justice League characters. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. He kills you know? a bunch of Justice League Europe people. And and, and so <laughs> kind of like James Robinson does the same thing, and and you know I like it's it's really nasty deaths he gives them too. like you know the uh, and I, I think it's that's a credit to his writing you know um you see fans complaining about oh it's such a nasty death such a horrible death blah, blah, blah. it's like well that means it's hit you and that means it added resonance mm-hmm. and that's a credit to their writing isn't it you know mm-hmm. so i think it's a credit to james robinson's writing and i'm not necessarily complaining that crimson fox has been killed or ever or amazing man or whoever it was but like i guess it's hard then to say oh it's outrageous that these robinson related characters were killed when he's killed some other character he's done exactly the same thing to somebody else's characters isn't he point taken point taken Uh, my, (laughs) my, 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 my counter argument is just i wanted to see more elongated man i mean absolutely no i i do agree with you like i I really like Phantom Lady, Black Condor, and all those freedom fighting fighters characters. I, I think they're great. And uh, I think it's such a shame that they were killed off. And Sue was, I mean, the way that Sue was killed off, I don't think that was a credit to the writer. I think that was just a bit horrible. To like, you know? <laughs> it's one of the biggest, uh, it's one of the biggest missteps in, uh, in DC yeah. history. Let yeah. me, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you guys a couple more questions um, regarding this regarding the series. Did you have a favorite story arc? I actually like when they go into space. I know you said that was the worst, but, <laughs> but I really like that one because <laughs> um, 
just seeing like uh, because like that spaceship they go up in and there's this big grand steampunky kind of yeah. ornate business like you know this rocket they go up in so it's almost like they've got a chunk of opal city and they they fly it to the silver age of dc comics you know because they interact it's not just the silver age they interact with all the sort of cosmic dc mythologies you know because uh, i think there's a bit of like um alan moore's swamp thing they reference as well i believe yeah they do that thing with um they pretty much do what alan moore did in his last uh, swamp thing arc which is go through a bunch of space including uh turning green lantern medfield into a bad guy yeah which which i was okay with i was fine like... with that yeah Medphil, who cares? Like <laughs> he had Medphil had his one good story with with an, an Alan Moore Swamp thing. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, I mean that's more than he deserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's tree. I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so again, it's this. I think that's what the Starman series is so good at is taking us on these tours of aspects of the DC universe, uh, and it that story arc is very much a tour of the cosmic corner of the dc universe the best aspects of the cosmic corner of the dc universe so i really like that and i really love um the first story arc as well because oh, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's my introduction to it yeah um and uh just you know because that where you really get jack clashing with his father and clashing with david and you really see jack's reluctance to be a superhero and sort of like the way he kills the bad guy in sins of the father he kills the missed son and it's presented in a not not in the way superheroes killing is usually presented you know it's not presented as this awful terrible thing like oh no i mustn't i can't but i must you know and neither is it presented as sort of like yeah take down the bad guys punisher style you know it's just sort of like i have to do this but it's yeah. the only time I'm going to do it, like, you know? And yeah. and so it's not kind of glorified. And, and, you, and again, even though it is presented in this way, it has consequences, you know? Uh, and, and it comes back to bite Jack in the ass. Yeah. So I just love how that's handled as well. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, to, uh, to look at what you just, what you just laid out, um, you know, that whole fight, it comes as a consequence of, uh, the Miss Son actually taking, uh, you know, his dad's tech, and so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and he he basically takes it and then like challenges him or whatever, right? So you know, it's like, what are you supposed to do, right? And and so, like you said, it's just he like it's rendered in like such a way that's like very matter of fact, right? So it's just like, you know, I mean, he put it in motion, man. I got to handle my business, right? And so, like you said, you know, there's ramifications later, so it doesn't just end there, but it wasn't seen as like, which, which is honestly like kind of a, a, um, it's like a counterpoint to a lot of the stuff that was happening in the nineties, because there was a lot of that, like the gratuity and stuff, right. With like the violence and stuff like that, because people were on this whole thing, like, you know, superheroes should just kill everybody that they come in contact with. Right. Just as a, as a general rule, because people wanted to see that. So um but just to have someone who especially in that moment was just insanely powerful to kind of just be like yeah i guess i kind of have to do this you know um but i'm doing it because it just needs to be done and just kind of leaving it at that you know what i mean that was kind of a different thing you know um and so like like what paulie was saying it wasn't the um i'm conflicted and it wasn't the yeah let this is what i came here to do but it's just like okay it's done like you know you know what i mean so that in that in and of itself was an interesting dynamic too you have a favorite uh particular story arc lamar no nah, i don't think i have a favorite you know what i mean that's <laughs> you know I, I i really think that people should go back and give this this series another chance really it's really not you know? like it's yeah. really a series you got to go from beginning to end isn't it yeah mm -hmm. immerse really, yourself really, really, in it like yeah, yeah. I don't have a favorite uh, story arc either. I do have a favorite single issue, though. Mm -hmm. um, it is a talking with David. That's a good one. Um, and it uh, is all the talking with David's are good ones, but in particular, the one with the dinner. 
uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, departed JSA members. So you've got yeah. Our Man, the Red Bee. Red Bee. <laughs> uh, the Red Bee and Michael. You can't leave Michael out. <laughs> <laughs> Michael um, and uh, Mr. Terrific mm -hmm. and uh, the original Black Canary. Yeah. So yeah. you've got, well, who, who else was in that thing? Um, let me see. Uh, you've got... Wow. Yeah, because that issue was kind of... He is, right? Because that issue is kind of top-loaded with people. Mm. Yeah, it's so... The great thing... So you've got... Oh, you got Dr. Midnight, the original Adam, mm -hmm. uh, and Zatanna's dad. Yeah, Zatara. Yep. Who uh, is as old as Superman. Yep. Also, if you're a fan of Zatanna, which I am, they will never let you forget that he existed. <laughs> <laughs> Every damn storyline, I swear. <laughs> okay. So that is, to me, what, the, the really mm. cool thing about it was it's done in black and white, as most of the talking with David's are. It's done in black and white, and he's talking to all of these people. And he's, he's talking about the life. And I really just found it really charming how they're talking about the superhero life, like, mm. like, like athletes talk about the road or how <laughs> celebrities talk about you know, talk about the, the culture of celebrity. They're talking about that life as if it's its own culture, which I think may have been the first time that I actually saw it treated that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then, but then artistically, it's done in black and white. And then everyone tells his own story. At the end of their own story, they have like a painted version of themselves and like this, this wonderful glory shot. And yeah. it ends with all of them. It's this wonderful painting um of of jack we, we see jack's back and i always like it when they show jack's back because they have to show the mm. the, the astrological uh symbol which yeah yeah is, which i always thought was really cool because he was like i'm gonna be a star man but it's gonna be about astrology and not astronomy because i'm not a scientist <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah and and then they all give him a toast and it's just this beautiful painting mm. that's my favorite issue that's my favorite single issue of star man yeah, that's a, that's a good one. That's good. And, yeah. You know, and, and I want to I want to say something too about what you were saying about the black and white picture. You know, a lot of times people have this idea that like things, you know, putting something in like the black and white um and taking a color away that it kind of antiquates it and dates it, but that it's odd it's honestly it's the other way around. It gives it a timeless element, you know. So, um, but that's a complaint. Like I hear people like, I don't watch black and black and white movies because you know they're old or whatever. And it's like, no, dude, ask anybody that loves the Andy Griffith show, for example. Uh, a lot of times they'll tell you once the show went from black and white to color, they'll tell you that don't exist, right? Because <laughs> it's all about the black and white episodes. So um, it's the same thing here. You know, it gives it that timeless element. So, yeah. and, which is important because you have the past and then you also have the future. You see what I'm saying? So, and you have all of that like together. So it's important, you know, so I, I just wanted to kind of illustrate that real quick before we, you know. What? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Sorry, it just Lamar, what Lamar said then just really struck me how like, you know, Opal's this sort of city where the past is sort of hand in hand with the future. But then of course, when everyone gets released from the poster, uh yeah there's this storyline where like this guy's been abducting people over the years from all over the world in a mm. in through a demonic poster and um jack rescues them it's as so awesome as it sounds yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you've got people uh from like all over the history of the 20th century basically just being released into opal city and they don't have a home anymore because they were taken from like the 1920s or wherever you know they've been taken from like years ago and um and so they all settle in opal so opal becomes the play a place where the, the past is literally hand in hand with the future <laughs> like you know so and that just kind of struck me when Lamar said that then <laughs> what do you think uh name one thing that you think aged really well like so if somebody still read this today like it would still hold up as well and name one thing that you don't think aged very well I'll start I think the thing that aged really well is just generally speaking the father-son dynamics 
Um, I think it's timeless. I think everybody can relate to it. The thing that didn't age really well uh, is what the mist does to Jack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think what the mist does to Jack could be played if it was played as more like, yeah, what she did was really bad, you know. But it, it's kind of not played like that, is it? It's like Jack's not that bothered about it other than the consequence of it, other than the fact that he... Sorry, what we should say what it is, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah. the, the mist uh, kidnaps Jack, and while he's unconscious, she basically rapes him uh, and gives birth to their son, who he does not see until nearly the end of the series. So mm -hmm. he's more bothered by the fact that he has a son with a mist than the fact that he was violated. Yeah. All right. I feel like that would be written completely differently now. Yeah, because hey, I, th I think back then, I think topics like rape, they weren't handled well by anyone. You know, I'm not singling no. out Robinson. I don't think anyone in comics was handling that topic very well. Um, no, not at so all. hopefully it would be done differently today. Definitely. I agree. Yeah. I, anything else you guys feel like aged badly or or well, particularly well? Well, I guess the references to Woody Allen films age badly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially in context. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. how about that? <laughs> <laughs> how about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd think that a, a book where they make specific references so much, I mean, there's a whole scene where where Jack and Ted talk about Jackson Pollock, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't age bad. That doesn't age badly at all. You'd think it would. Mm. Right. But mm -hmm. yeah, it still works. It still works. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, I agree with you, like the, the father son dynamics and the characters, you know, the way they're written, the very human way they're written. That's what's aged the best. I think, you know, I feel like the whole lingo that Robinson was trying to give um, the, the the heroes, you know, like calling it the life and that stuff. I feel like that's something that we could really run with that nobody has ever run with. Hmm. Um, and the whole comic ends with Ted saying, my work is done. Uh, the, my, my work will benefit all of humanity for, for, for the remainder of history. And you will never need you will never need money because the patents will pay for everything. That's never, ever, ever, ever been played on ever <laughs> in the entire history of DC comics. So I feel like that's something that it's, it's still there. It's waiting for somebody to pick it up. Um, Star girl is still around carrying the cosmic rod. So yeah, yeah, it's just waiting for somebody to pick it up. It's kind of like you can see shades of it in um, the Stargirl TV series, you know, the whole sort of legacy aspect that they explore, even though it's based more on Jeff Johns's Stargirl stuff, obviously, than it is James Robinson's Starman. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, James Robinson stuff is never explicitly referenced. But that sort of like that uh, adherence to that sort of celebration of legacy and history. Uh, and the mythology of the DC universe, that's very present in um, the Stargirl TV series. And I feel like that sort of celebration of the mythology of DC of the DC universe and that approach to DC continuity, just keeping the broad strokes and picking and choosing them when you need them for your story, that's mm. very much what Robinson did. I think that's very much where DC are going now. And that's very much where they didn't try to deliberately didn't try to go during the new 52, yeah. yes. which, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a waste not to use it. You've got these amazing, like this rich history to dip into this tapestry to kind of pick from and, and it's a waste not to, you know? Yep. So I think Starman did that so well. And that aspect of it is becoming more relevant perhaps. Mm hmm. I'll leave you. I'll uh, end this with a one butterfly effect type of thing. Um, Starman was not a particularly big seller, but it was critically acclaimed. It did lead into a series called JSA, which yep. is where Jeff Johns got his start, and we all know what happens from that point on. It is yeah. so. In other words, 
comic book history is completely different if the series didn't exist. Yeah. 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 And one other thing too, before, before we dip, um, where you were talking about things that, that aged well, you know how like in the series, like usually when you take, when you have a longstanding artist that everybody loves and they come off the book and a new guy comes on, usually yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's a big problem. Um, the quality of the book suffers and, and especially with DC, um, you see it ultimately ending in a book getting canceled, right? Unless it's like a, unless it's like a thing where like co- artists are constantly rotating off of it and that's kind of what it's made for. But in this case, that didn't happen because um, the artist that replaced, the artist that started the book out and all of that um, is great. And um, just some of the stuff, like the way that, you know, he, the artist, um, Peter uh, Snedgeberg, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I thought it was come, Snedberg, but I don't know. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Y'all have to forgive me. But, um, you know. Uh, I'm also but, guessing. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Somebody get it straight on that. And I know y'all are coming. But, um, yeah. Um, that back half of the series, man. He kind of blended. You know what it reminded me of? It makes me think of Batman the animated series. Yes. I, you yes. know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. It always makes me think of that because you have this kind of like more modern streamlined design sense, but you have all of these elements that look like they come out of the 30s and the 40s, you know, and the way that he rendered it um, was it was fantastic. You know, that's a very hard thing to do because, in a, you know, like he didn't really ha- add things that didn't need to be there. Alex, you know, Toth. like Alex Toth, that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 That kind of stuff. If the line wasn't necessary, it wasn't there. That's a hard thing to pull off when you got all of this other stuff happening in a book like this, you know? So, um, you know, yeah, I, I got to take my hat off to him because um, number one, he had his work cut out for him. And number two, uh, coming behind Harris, you know, and number two, um, he, you know, he just knocked it out the park. You know, and a lot of the best images in that series come from his, from his work, you know? Um, it's true. So, yeah, and it normally doesn't go like that. Usually when a, when a book switches artists like that, it's, it's cancel time, not too long after that, you know? No, and they, they pretty much split it almost evenly, 50-50. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing yep. stuff, amazing stuff. Paul, you got anything to close us off with? or? Uh, just, uh, I hope we see James Robinson back at DC um yeah sometime i know he's been uh, doing some stuff for marvel over the past few years but i'd love to see him it's on something back at dc and again dipping into dc mythology it would be a real treat so hopefully mm-hmm. one day so starman everyone recommended highly recommended by the three of us uh please let us know what you think uh click like share and subscribe and welcome to the comics cube